All right, great. Thank you very much, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be back together. Today, we're announcing charges following a significant national security cyber investigation <clears throat> first disclosed publicly more than two years ago. As laid out in today's indictment, North Korea's operatives, using keyboards rather than guns, stealing digital wallets of cryptocurrency instead of stacks of cash, have become the world's leading bank robbers. The department will continue to confront malicious nation-state cyber activity with our unique tools and work with our fellow agencies and the family of norms abiding nations to do the same. We were all back together in September 2018 when the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central District of California, the same office that's here with us today, with the assistance of the National Security Division, charged a North Korean programmer who is working for the government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea with conspiring to conduct some of the most damaging cyber attacks ever, including the November 2014 destructive attack and hack and dump targeting Sony Pictures Entertainment over a comedy film they didn't like, February 2016 cyber-enabled heist of $81 million from the Bank of Bangladesh and other heists, and the May 2017 global WannaCry 2.0 attack. The events, as described in that indictment, provided the first indications that the North Korean regime would become focused on and adept at stealing money from institutions around the world. Today, the department unseals an indictment returned by a grand jury in the Central District, charging the same DPRK programmer, as well as two newly identified DPRK conspirators with a campaign of cyber heists and extortion schemes targeting both traditional and cryptocurrencies. The indictment adds to the list of victims since 2018, including continued cyber-enabled heists from banks on four continents targeting over $1.2 billion. It also describes in stark detail how the DPRK cyber threat has followed the money and turned its revenue generation sites on the most cutting-edge aspects of international finance including through the theft of cryptocurrency from exchanges and other financial institutions. In some cases, through the creation and deployment of cryptocurrency applications with hidden backdoors. The indictment refines the attribution of this crime spree to the DPRK Military Intelligence Services, specifically the Reconnaissance General Bureau, or RGB. Simply put, the regime has become a criminal syndicate with a flag which harnesses its state resources to steal hundreds of millions of dollars. In a moment, you will hear more details about the charges and evidence in the case from the acting U.S. Attorney for the Central District, from the Bureau, and from the United States Secret Service. But I want to take a moment to highlight the significance of these charges for the Department, the United States, and the international community. As the description of victim entities in the indictment shows, the DPRK's malicious activities are a global problem requiring global awareness, condemnation, and cooperative disruption. With this indictment and related disruptions, the United States continues to do its part. First, we continue to shine a light on the global campaign of criminality being waged by the DPRK. Nation state indictments like this are an important step in identifying the problem, calling it out in a legally, legally rigorous format, and building international consensus. Second, in addition to educating the U.S. public and international community about this activity, we're also targeting the networks through which the DPRK is cashing out its ill-gotten gains. As will be described in more detail by my colleagues, the department has obtained custody over a dual U.S.-Canadian national who organized the laundering of millions of dollars stolen by the DPRK hackers. He has admitted his role in these criminal schemes in a plea agreement, and he will be held accountable for his conduct. This prosecution demonstrates the commitment of the department to ensuring that those who conspire with the DPRK hackers will face justice. The department was also able to seize and expects to ultimately return almost $2 million stolen by the DPRK from a New York-based financial services company. This follows on similar seizure actions announced in March and August 2020 in which the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia seized and froze approximately $8.5 million dollars of cryptocurrency. These cryptocurrency seizures and prosecution of high level money launderer of a high level money launderer collectively represent important steps in disrupting the DPRK hackers and their money laundering networks and illustrate the department's commitment to repatriating stolen funds 
before they reach the DPRK. Third, the United States is empowering network defenders. As you will hear, the prosecutors and investigators have, throughout this investigation, worked closely with victims and intended victims of the DPRK hackers, and have provided these victims with information about avoiding and remediating infections. This work continues today. Accompanying this announcement, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, with the assistance of the Department of the Treasury, are releasing a joint cybersecurity advisory and malware analysis report regarding the DPRK's malicious cryptocurrency application. The criminal investigation leading to today's indictment obtained that information for distribution to network defenders. Further, the context provided in today's indictment underscores the necessity of paying attention to this advisory and its recommendations. Fourth, the allegations in today's indictments inform and empower the international community so that they can not only join us in condemning this activity, but also help to stop it. In that regard, the European Union's July 2020 sanctions related to the, to the Lazarus Group were a welcome development. We commend the EU for its initial efforts to impose consequences for state-sponsored malicious cyber activities. Now it's time for other nations that wish to be regarded as responsible actors to step up. The conspirators described in today's indictment are alleged to have been working at times from locations in China and Russia. The DPRK has also utilized Chinese over-the-counter cryptocurrency traders and other criminal networks to launder the funds. Just as the United States has disrupted the DPRK's crime spree through arrests, forfeitures, and seizures, the time is beyond ripe for Russia and China, as well as any other country whose entities or nationals play a role in the DPRK revenue generation, the efforts to take action. The department's criminal charges are uniquely credible forms of attribution. We can prove these allegations in open court beyond a reasonable doubt using only unclassified, admissible evidence. And they are the only way in which the department speaks. If the choice here is between remaining silent while we at the department watch nations engage in malicious norms violating cyber activity or charge these cases, the choice is obvious. We will charge them. Before I turn this over, I would like to thank the agents at the FBI in Los Angeles, Charlotte, and Raleigh, the Secret Service in Savannah, Los Angeles, and DC, and the prosecutors in Los Angeles and here at NSD for stepping up to the plate to play their part. Gracie? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tracy Wilkison, and I'm the acting United States Attorney here in Los Angeles. Thank you all for joining us today. Nearly two and a half years ago, we charged a North Korean computer programmer in a criminal complaint with being a member of a conspiracy that conducted sophisticated cyber attacks around the world on behalf of the North Korean government. The indictment unsealed today by my office represents a significant development in this case, adding two more North Korean defendants and alleging a series of criminal schemes beginning in 2014 and continuing through last year. The indictment alleges that the three defendants were part of the North Korean regime, specifically that they worked for the Reconnaissance General Bureau, a military intelligence agency. The hackers charged in the indictment were members of units known in the cybersecurity community as Lazarus Group and Advanced Persistent Threat 38. While the cybersecurity community recognizes these two as different North Korean groups, the criminal investigation has revealed that these groups were part of a single conspiracy that worked under the North Korean military to destroy computer systems and to steal money and information, all for revenge and to finance the criminal regime. The indictment we're announcing today builds on the charges in the 2018 complaint which describes how members of the conspiracy were responsible for several highly destructive and well-known computer intrusions, including the cyber attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment right here in our community. The indictment includes these intrusions and cyber attacks, but greatly expands the scope of the allegations to include entirely new types of schemes in which the hackers attempted to steal hundreds of millions of dollars. 
Some of these intrusions occurred as recently as a few months ago using newly identified strains of malware uncovered by the FBI as part of this investigation. Count one of the indictment alleges several new hacking schemes. First, building off the allegations in the complaint, the indictment alleges a series of cyber heists targeting banks around the world. The hackers typically gained access to a bank's computer network and sent secure messages through the SWIFT system that is used to transfer money between banks. The indictment alleges that these attacks sought to steal more than $1.2 billion from financial institutions around the world, most recently from a bank in Malta in February of 2019. Second, the indictment alleges ATM cash-out schemes in which the hackers used malware to take control of bank ATMs, allowing for limitless cash withdrawals. This scheme referred to by the U.S. government and cybersecurity advisements as fast cash, allowed co-conspirators to withdraw $6.1 million from one bank alone. Third, the indictment states that the North Korean hackers engaged in cyber extortions in which they would gain access to computer systems and then steal data or deploy ransomware that would demand payment. Fourth, the indictment contains significant allegations about the development and spread of a series of malicious applications purportedly for trading and storing cryptocurrency, but which were actually designed to give the North Koreans a backdoor into computer systems. The indictment specifically identifies many of these malicious cryptocurrency applications some of which were still being developed only a few months ago. Such an application was allegedly used in a cryptocurrency heist in August of 2020 to steal from a company in New York. In total, the indictment alleges three cryptocurrency thefts, totaling $112 million. Count two in the indictment discusses another scheme related to cryptocurrency. In 2017 and 18, the North Koreans developed a digital token called Marine Chain, which would trick investors into purchasing ownership interests in marine shipping vessels, such as cargo ships, not knowing that they would be, be providing cash to an outlaw regime. The Marine Chain token, supported by a blockchain, not only would have given the North Koreans controlling interest in shipping vessels, it would have allowed them to obtain funds from abroad and skirt U.S. sanctions that were placed on the regime. The scope of these crimes by the North Korean hackers is staggering. They are the crimes of a nation state that has stopped at nothing to extract revenge and obtain money to prop up its regime. We chose to unseal the indictment today for several reasons, one of which was the related announcement of a criminal case against a money launderer, Gala Balamari, who is being prosecuted by my office and is in custody in the Southern District of Georgia. This high-level and trusted money launderer for the North Korean hackers has agreed to plead guilty to conspiring to launder funds from both cyber heists and ATM cash outs. According to a plea agreement that was unsealed today, Alamari conspired to steal and then launder tens of millions of dollars for the North Koreans and other criminals. I also want to make very clear to the victims of these crimes that we stand with them. For years, agents and prosecutors here in Los Angeles have collaborated with private cybersecurity companies to analyze the methods of attacks and to arm potential victims with information that will help them to avoid future attacks. This morning, we are building upon that work through the issuance 
by the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security of a joint cybersecurity advisory and malware analysis reports on a family of cryptocurrency malware produced by the North Koreans. This analysis is designed to provide the cybersecurity community and the public with information about identifying this malware, avoiding intrusions, and remedying infections. In addition, we are continuing to do everything we can to make the victims whole. Last week, we obtained warrants to seize cryptocurrency worth nearly $2 million that was stolen by the North Korean hackers from a financial services firm in New York. Those funds will go back to the victim. This in-depth investigation involved a number of law enforcement entities, cooperation across agencies and countries, and tireless efforts by all involved. I want to compliment and thank the outstanding agents with the FBI and the Secret Service. I also want to acknowledge two prosecutors in my office who have worked for years on this investigation, Assistant United States Attorneys Anil Antony and Cal Shabaki of our Cyber and Intellectual Property Crime section. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Christy. Okay, very good. Good morning. My name is Christy Johnson. I'm the Assistant Director in Charge of the FBI's Los Angeles Field Office. The threat posed to the people of the United States, United States interests abroad, and worldwide targets by cyber criminals operating at the behest of North Korea is alarming. But we are facing this threat head on with a variety of resources. A cadre of dedicated pr prosecutors and investigators, including special agents, analysts, computer scientists, have continued to build this case since 2014. This talented team has worked tirelessly on this investigation. This case makes clear the extent North Korean adversaries will go to harm our citizens, our businesses, and our foreign allies to generate money for the regime and attempt to weaken our society, our industries, and our economy. As my colleagues have pointed out, this wide range of intrusions and attacks are attributed to programmers working for the DPRK. Please know that when we assign attribution to a particular cyber aggressor, we do so with high confidence while relying on very solid evidence. The indictment outlines a broad range of cyber crimes attributed to these defendants, all three of which are North Korean citizens who were members of the Reconnaissance General Bureau a military intelligence agency of the DPRK, which conducts criminal computer intrusions. Arrest warrants have been issued in, in the federal court in Los Angeles for three defendants, John Chang Hyuk, Kim Il, and Park Jin Hyuk. They are considered fugitives from justice. The wanted, part, excuse me, the wanted posters can be found at FBI.gov. They are believed to be located in North Korea. However, anyone within the United States with information about their specific whereabouts should contact their local FBI office. Anyone outside the United States should contact their nearest United States Embassy. If you believe you have been a victim of these or similar acts, or you are witness to these or similar activities, please contact the FBI. I'd like to highlight the cooperation the FBI received from various victims of these attacks, as well as from cybersecurity companies and our foreign partners, all of which we could not do this type of investigation without. Victim information gleaned from each attack, including tactics, techniques, and procedures used by the perpetrators is used and shared with other potential targets and victims in order to mitigate damage and prevent future intrusions. As has been mentioned by my colleagues, the FBI and DHS, in coordination with Treasury, have issued a joint cybersecurity advisory and malware, malware analysis reports, which have been made available to you, regarding North Korean cryptocurrency malware. This important advisory expands on the North Korean cyber threat referred by the U.S. government as Hidden Cobra. The advisory and malware analysis reports identify specific malware and indicators of compromise related to the Applejuice family of malware. Applejuice refers to a host of related malicious cyber 
cryptocurrency applications, which are further described in the advisory. The Joint Cybersecurity Advisory and Malware Analysis provide the cybersecurity community and the public with information about North Korean malicious cryptocurrency applications in order to prevent compromise and intrusion, as well as to remedy infections that have already occurred. As was mentioned by my colleague from the United States Attorney's Office here in California in the Central District, following a 2020 North Korean intrusion and theft from a United States-based financial services company, the FBI located and froze approximately 1.8 million United States dollars worth of cryptocurrency. Last week, the FBI obtained warrants for the seizure of those stolen cryptocurrencies and is working with the United States Attorney's Office to return the funds to the victim. We cannot investigate these cases in a vacuum. We routinely collaborate with private sector and government partners both domestically and globally. We rely on one another to prevent future intrusions, to address large-scale state-sponsored attacks, and to impose risk and consequence upon our cyber adversaries. While we have worked with scores of victims and partners on this case, I'd like to specifically thank the following around the globe various FBI legal attache offices located in U.S. embassies around the world, our foreign law enforcement partners, and the United States Secret Service. In addition to their assistance in the cyber investigation, the arrest of the money laundering co-conspirators is due to their efforts, and I thank them today. The FBI expends a great deal of resources training businesses and the public on how to defend their computer systems and networks, the goal of which is to protect from reputational harm and avoid potential financial loss that inevitably results from any large-scale attack. Prevention is the key to protecting your systems. The defendants in this case conducted a range of cyber attacks from simple phishing schemes to highly sophisticated malware creation and everything in between at the behest of the North Korean government. This case is a perfect example of the destruction that can be caused by a cyber attack and the grave threat these attacks pose to our national security. The FBI will continue to work with our private and public partners to combat these attacks and prevent future ones. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn it over to Special Agent in Charge, Jesse Baker of the United States Secret Service in Los Angeles. Thank you, Adic Johnson. I appreciate that. Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Baker, that's J-E-S-S-E -S -S -E Baker, and I'm the Special Agent in Charge of the Los Angeles Field Office. It's my honor to represent the Secret Service here today. Now, I know we've already heard from a lot of speakers here about the conspiracy, and I want to draw attention to some of the documents that you have about the specific case with Ghalib Alamari and his role as a prolific money launderer as part of this North Korean conspiracy. So our involvement when we looked at not only the arrest, but ultimately the guilty plea, is looking at this and what was our role. Well, we did what we've did since 1865. We followed the money. We did this through the use of technology and really old school detective work. While you've heard about how the suspects use a multitude of complex schemes to steal money, they still have to find a way to move the money. So in this case, the money was laundered a variety of ways. We saw that people were directed to move funds between bank accounts, through wire transfers, withdrawing cash from accounts, and ultimately converting the funds to cryptocurrency where they would then be put into private wallets. This laundering was sophisticated, it was really extensive. But these methods left an information trail. So we really had to collect the dots in order to connect the dots. When I look at this, I really think that this case is like a thousand piece puzzle, but it's spread out all over the map. In the beginning, the pieces are hard to connect, but you put a few together and eventually a clear picture emerges. And that's what we saw here with this case. Now, my second point I'd like to cover is that we continue to see a confluence of state and non-state actors in cybercrime. We have a growing alliance between global transnational criminal organizations and those responsible for carrying out state-sponsored cybercrime. It's happening with increasing regularity. Oftentimes, it's, it's no longer either criminal groups or nation states. These distinctions have really blurred. Now, my third and final point is that the extreme complexity of this case required a really robust and inclusive investigative method. You know, when the Secret Service protects the president, we don't just use one specific division. We leverage the skill sets of multiple different groups, both internal and external. And we really modeled this case using those same methods, that same methodology, drawing on the expertise of a really variety of people throughout the agency. It took a lot to get here, and so I want to acknowledge that we looked at that through the efforts of the Secret Service office in Savannah, Georgia, our Global Investigations Operations Center, which we refer to as the JIOC, 
here in the Los Angeles field office, as well as efforts through Miami, New York, and Ottawa. And I also want to echo what you've heard on the call. You hear this a lot, but it cannot be more true that the importance and strength of our federal partnerships and state and local partnerships is critical and key to the successful prosecutions like what you've seen today. So in closing, we are very proud of this case, and we are not slowing down. We are full speed ahead. The men and women of the Secret Service will continue our 156-year history of focusing on complex financial crimes for the benefit of the American public. Thanks for allowing me to speak to you today. All right. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you uh, to all our speakers. Again, uh, please queue up, pushing star one. And um, uh, as soon as we get some folks queued up, we'll start the Q&A. When you ask a question, um, please direct it to either uh, Assistant Attorney General John Demers or Acting U.S. Attorney Tracy Wilkerson or uh, Christy with the FBI or Jesse with the Secret Service, uh, Christy Johnson or Jesse Baker. If you forget their names, you can just uh, say Secret Service, FBI, or DOJ, and we'll figure it out. Um, thank you. Operator, please open the line for questions now. We will now begin the question and answer session. Again, to ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Del Wilbur with the LA Times. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Um, this is for John. It's a two-part question. Um, could you put this this scheme, this uh, hacking, these hacking attacks, and North Korea's overall strategy into the broader context of the cyber threats we're facing, like you know China and Russia? They do it differently. It seems that um, North Korea is after money um, more than the espionage and uh, spurned by uh, China and Russia. And the second question is, it kind of goes to the China-Russia thing, what were these hackers doing in Russia and China, if you can say and provide a little color about that? Thank you. Thanks, Bill. So on your first question, I mean, look, I, I think you got it. What we see almost uniquely out of uh, North Korea is, you know, uh, trying to raise funds through illegal cyber activity. So that includes, as reflected in this indictment, you know, the theft of cryptocurrency, the theft of traditional currencies, extortion, cyber extortion schemes, um, and, <clears throat> uh, and and these marine digital tokens that they had uh, also uh, fraudulently uh, developed. So their need as a country is uh, for currency because of the, the their economic system and because of the sanctions that are placed on them. And so they use their cyber capabilities uh, to get uh, currency wherever uh, they can do that. And that's not something that we really see from actors in um, China and Russia uh, or in Iran who are after different aspects, whether it's intellectual property or export controlled uh, technology or disrupting our elections, whatever it is. We, you know, those, those countries have, have different kinds of activity than do uh, the North Koreans. The North Koreans are very focused on their, on their need for currency. On your second question, I mean, I really can't go into much detail about what they were doing in these countries, but it does highlight uh, the problem that I think some of our other cases have, have highlighted as well of Russia and China not only engaging in their own malign cyber, uh, malign cyber activities, but also providing a safe harbor or a place for whether it's cyber criminals uh, or in this case, uh, other nation state actors um, to act. And, uh, you know, I think, as you know, due to the, the authoritarian, uh, totalitarian nature of those countries, um, there's very little of significance that goes on there without those governments knowing about it. Our next, next question will come from it will come from Ellen Nakashima with the Washington Post. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, this question is for anyone who feels uh, qualified to answer. Uh, just a couple, actually a couple of questions. How much did the hackers or defendants actually, are they accused of actually stealing versus attempting to steal? And secondly, 
Are cryptocurrency exchanges regulated? Are they supposed to follow the know your customer rules the same way banks are? And if not, are they part of the problem? Tracy, do you want to take the question on the um, the amount? Absolutely. Um, this is Tracy Wilkinson. Uh, so I can't really comment on the exact amount of money that the hackers made, but as set forth in the indictment, um, the hackers successfully stole $81 million from Bangladesh Bank and conducted other cyber-enabled cyber bank heists and ATM cash-outs and obtained millions of dollars through extortion and theft of cryptocurrency. And I know that they attempted to steal more than $1.3 billion. So knowing the exact amount that they've received, I can't really comment, and I just ha have that information. Jesse, do you have anything you want to add to that from on, you could serve on the regulation piece? When it comes to cryptocurrency, there, there's certainly a lot of information out there. Can you, can you phrase, Ellen, again, the way you, you pronounce that sort of end about whether they follow the rules? So, so banks are supposed to, you know, ask questions about their customers and, and who they are and where they come from and basically follow rules, of the, the, they're called know your customer rules, and that's an attempt to make sure that they're not doing suspicious transactions. Um, but are cryptocurrency exchanges regulated in the same way, and if not, should they be? Otherwise, how are you going to um, sort of ever detect this activity earlier and then recover the money for the victims? Thanks, Ellen. I, you know, I'll refer any policy sort of decisions about regulations of cryptocurrency and traders to, to policymakers, if you will. I'll, I'll speak to a little bit, though, about the techniques, because you inferred there about how are you going to still catch them? And I think that's what, what is really great, for example, about the Al Alamari case that you see where he pled guilty today is that at some point that cryptocurrency is still only codes. It's not worth anything to them until it can be converted to cash. So at some point that has to happen. And when that happens, it's going to leave some sort of trail. And so we always use legal processes in order to, change, to sort of follow the money, like I said in the beginning. It's worthless to them until it's converted to money. So at some point they're going to do that. And there's ways that we can examine that through lawful processes when that happens. Our next okay, question, thank you. Next will, question. Come, will come from Aruna Biswanatha with Wall Street Journal. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, just to follow up on Ellen's question um, and clarify, so the $1.2 billion um, figure, that was money that was attempted to be stolen, but you don't have a figure of what was actually stolen. And um, I think I had heard earlier that a lot of that was taken from uh, or tried to be taken from victim banks around the world using um, fake uh, SWIFT codes. That seems some, pretty reminiscent of what happened in the Bangladesh Bank heist. Was there some were they using the same tools that they had used there, or these were newer methods that tried to get around the improvements that banks had put in place after that heist? Um, and then also, just to uh, go back also to the initial co the coin offering, that seems um, like a newer tactic. How is this sort of, with the price of Bitcoin so high, is this something you see them trying to do more and more of? Um, how, how big a deal is this going to be going forward? This is Tracy Wilkinson. Just on the issue of the amounts of money, I will confirm, yes, the, the $1.2 billion is the attempted to steal the um, uh, $81 million from the Bangladesh, Bangladesh Bank is the a actually stolen, and there's specific amounts uh, for individual overt acts is listed in the indictment, um, and so that's um, available to you. Um, then I'll turn uh, the remainder over either to Christy or to the backgrounder. Thank you, Tracy. We'll go ahead and push that to the backgrounder for more detail. Our next question will come from Eric Tucker with the Associated Press. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for doing this. I just wanted to clarify about the nature of the conspiracy and the attribution for each of the bullet-pointed um, hacks. Is the allegation that these three gentlemen each played a role in each of those individual hacks and intrusions that are that are delineated in the indictment, or is that not necessarily the case? I just want to be clear as to 
because I appreciate that it's a conspiracy, so I wasn't sure you have to establish that. This is Tracy Wilkinson. Yeah, these individuals are charged in the overall conspiracy. Um, where there is um, specific attribution for specific acts, they are named in the overt acts in the, in the indictment. Our next question will come from Eamon Jabbers with CNBC. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for doing the call. Uh, two questions for you, if I could. The first one is, um, I guess, for FBI uh, on the diplomacy aspect of all this. Have you guys seen the North Korean criminal enterprise you're outlining here, outlining here respond in any way to U.S. diplomatic overtures? That is, the former president of the United States was meeting with the leader of North Korea extensively or a couple of times in uh, 18 and 19. Did you see any pause uh, during that diplomatic overture, or did this continue unabated through that period of time? Uh, and then the second question is, I know you're, you can't quantify the total losses here, can you quantify just cryptocurrency losses here, uh, and can you narrow that even down to American cryptocurrency investor losses in terms of dollars? So two questions, one on the diplomatic overture and one on the U.S. cryptocurrency losses. Thanks. Thank you for that question. Christy Johnson with the FBI. On, on the first piece, I am going to, for the broader perspective, I will push that back to the um, Mr. Demers back in Washington, D.C., Thanks. Hey, Eamon, um, it's John Demers. Uh, I mean, on your first question, I don't think we've mapped the activity of this conspiracy against sort of the timeline of the diplomatic engagements with North Korea. So I don't know that we could answer, you know, whether there were lulls in this activity uh, during, you know, certain times of that engagement and then whether it picked up after that. I mean, the North Koreans overall have been um, fairly persistent in their uh, engagement of these types of uh, of, of cyber crimes. So, you know, but beyond that, I don't, we didn't sort of do a TikTok month by month or something like that. Hi, this is Tracy Wilkinson. On the, on the specific question as to the um, amount of money stolen for, um, uh, by the, by way of the cryptocurrency heist, um, that number is alleged in the indictment at, at $112 million. Our next question will come from Claire and, and Hines. Just to, Go ahead. Uh, sir, can I just follow up on that? That, that? Thank you, Tracy. This is Christy Johnson with the FBI. So we just don't have a breakdown uh, within the U.S. of the losses related to cryptocurrency. So just to shore that up, thank you. Our next question will come from Claire Hines with the CBS News. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for doing this. I was just wondering if you could speak at all to the um, threat assessment or continued threat level that these groups like Lazarus and others um, are uh, still um, pose to the United States. This is Christy Johnson with the FBI. Uh, the, the, this group, the Lazarus group, does continue to pose a threat across all industries. Thank you. Our next question will come from Jerry Dunleavy with the Washington Examiner. Please go ahead. Thanks, guys. I think this is probably for um, Mr. Demers. Um, my guess is that these hackers, with them being in North Korea, aren't expected to come into U.S. custody. Um, so would DOJ be able to just um, kind of lay out the benefit that sees in attribution like this and in filing indictments like this, um, even or even especially when um, the people that have been indicted probably aren't going to stand trial? Thanks. Sure. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I expect they won't be traveling here anytime soon, although I wish they would so we could prove all these charges in court. In terms of what the um, benefits of these indictments are it's something I tried to address in the in the opening remarks. I mean, we do them for a number of reasons. One is educational, to draw attention uh, of the public uh, and of policymakers to the kind of activity that we're seeing from these different uh, malicious nation-state actors, uh, including here North Korea. 
And I think over the course of our indictments, over the course of years, I think the public and policymakers, both in the executive branch and in Congress, have a much better understanding of uh, the way that these different uh, actors uh, do their work. The second is to show to these actors that they are not uh, as anonymous as they think there are, as, as they think they are. As you see in this uh, indictment, you can see photos of the um, hackers at issue. We've done that in other cases too. You think you're anonymous behind a keyboard, but you're not. And we lay out uh, how we can prove uh, that uh, attribution, again, not to a nation state level, not even to a unit level within a military or an intelligence organization, but to the individual uh, hacker. The third is that our charges often enable other agencies to use their tools, whether they're sanctions or otherwise, uh, to uh, bring costs on the hackers and the countries that uh, harbor them or use them. Uh, the fourth is our work with the international community, and we as this case shows, we do a lot of work uh, on the law enforcement side and on the intelligence side with the international community in order to uh, bring uh, uh, these cases forward, but also working with them uh, to help them impose uh, costs separately and to call out this activity separately. Uh, and you see that in the EU's actions and their sanctions against Elizabeth groups and against others over the summer. Those are the first set of, of EU sanctions for nation state cyber activity, so a significant development which uh, can be attributed in part to, I think, a lot of the work that we've done together on these cases. Um, and, you know, all with a view of creating norms for nation-state behavior uh, in cyberspace and then encouraging uh, those countries that are breaking those norms uh, to follow them, and, but also uh, warning other countries who may be thinking of uh, engaging in that kind of behavior that we will catch them out and, and call them out. Thanks. Um, we have time for one more question, and then we'll go into the backgrounder. So, uh, Grant, could you please, uh, whoever's next on the list, give them the last question? Sure. Our last question will come from David Shortell with CNN. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for doing this. A couple questions. Um, first, perhaps for Tracy, can you help break out for us the new allegations that we're seeing today regarding the Sony hack in the Bangladesh? the Bangladesh Bank uh, episode, beyond obviously the addition of two new co-conspirators. And then the second question, perhaps for John, is um, we've discussed today the novel and sophisticated tools that these military hackers are using. Can you expand on that a bit? What's the, what's the pace of new tools that they're cranking out over in, in North Korea? And, and how did their capabilities stack up against other bad or other good actors around the world? Hi, this is Tracy Wilkinson. So, um, first, the so there's two counts in the indictment. The first count alleges um, a conspiracy with respect to, to hacking, and then the second is a conspiracy with respect to fraud. Okay, and in the first count, the new allegations. So you, you have the original allegations regarding the um, SWIFT system and the cyber heists targeting the banks. And then it adds in um, three additional schemes. One is the ATM cash out scheme, where they took control of the bank ATMs and were using that to cash out millions of dollars. Two is the um, uh, cyber extortions, where they would gain access to the computer systems, steal data, and then extort money in exchange for the, um, for the data. And then third is the um, the cryptocurrency allegations, where they were um, designing um, uh, systems that were supposed that looked like they were supposed to trade and store cryptocurrency, but were actually giving a backdoor into the system so that they could then then steal the cryptocurrency. Um, and in addition, in count one, there were additional new bank heists that were added since the time of the complaint. And then count two um, is this marine chain cryptocurrency fraud conspiracy where they were um, developing a digital token to trick people into investing, not knowing that they would be supporting the North Korean regime. Okay. Hey, Dave. Uh, there's another part to Dave's question. Hey, David, it's John uh, Demers. Uh, as to your other questions, I mean, look, the North Koreans are among the most sophisticated um, nation-state cyber actors in the world. They may lack resources, but those that they have, they dedicate 
um, in large part to their uh, cyber program. Uh, and uh, they, ha they have very good uh, hackers uh, who work for them. And, uh, you know, in terms of the pace of their tool development, I, you know, I don't think I could answer that with, with any specificity, but they continue to, um, you know, engage in new tool development. And, and as this shows, you know, cook up new schemes um, for uh, raising money for the regime. So uh, it, it's a very sophisticated actor. It's a dangerous actor, especially when it comes to financial institutions. And so it's one that we're going to continue to, to investigate and, and look at. Hi, David. Right. It's, uh, it's real quick. It's hey, John, Jesse I'd like Baker. To add Christy Johnson. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jesse. Just, I'm sorry, just super, real okay, quick, David. It's, uh, it's uh, Jesse Baker from Secret Service. I wanted to acknowledge what you talked about, about sort of the cutting edge. And we've seen that in so many different ways of people basically trying to separate you from your wallet. And what I don't want to miss is that we see this in currency. For example, they design new currency and people are already there trying to counterfeit it. No matter what sort of devices you put in, people will always push the envelope. And because we're so interconnected on these digital tools, they're leveraging that constantly. But remember, they still have to utilize people outside of the country. As we saw here with this Alamari case, there are still runners that are come to America. They're going to be taking money out of banks, and this is where we're going to look for them. And I think another final point that is critically important is the social engineering aspect of this. Remember, on business email compromise, how many times have we gotten emails about this or click on this link? And once you do, the whole system oftentimes can be compromised. And I can tell you, people at work hate me because any email that comes to me, I never click. <laughs> I never click. And I think there's so much still out there in education with the public to be so careful and mindful on what we click on and what we do, because it is an incredibly key aspect. No matter how advanced they are, social engineering is still a critical component of this. All right, Christy, do you have something Christy to add Johnson to that? Here. That's a, yep, thank you very much. Um, exactly the point I wanted to make, Jesse, thank you. And, and the prevention piece is just critical. It is. Um, it really highlights the need for these malware analysis reports and the cybersecurity advisory that was issued today just to continue to educate and inform the public and our, um, all of our partners around the globe. It is uh, the, the click of the link sounds very basic and rudimentary, but if we can educate one more person to not do that and to make sure that they know exactly what they're re um, responding to when they get unsolicited um, uh, emails or job offers that entice them to click a link that ultimately can introduce malware to their system, that's, that's our goal, is to, to continue the prevention efforts. So thank you for allowing me to make this comment.